Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. To some of you, welcome back. To others, thank you for signing up for the conversations with the C-suite, powering global recovery and change, the World Affairs Councils of America's virtual conference this week. We are in day four, and we've heard a lot about impactful and disruptive changes to many different industries. We're gonna bring you that today too with Charles Rifkin. I am gonna introduce Charles in a moment, but first, uh, just a reminder that you are able to participate in this conversation because you're watching on YouTube Live and there's a chat box. So I encourage you from as soon as you'd like to, to submit questions to us. We will get to them in the final 15 minutes of this 45 minute session. I'm Bill Clifford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Councils of America, and I'm delighted to present Charles Rifkin, who is Chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association based here in Washington, DC. The MPA's mission is to be the global voice and advocate for the film, TV, and streaming industries worldwide, uh, for the United States companies that is worldwide. In September, 2017, MPA chat tapped Mr. Rifkin for his unique blend of experience as a top diplomat and as a media executive. He was US ambassador to France in 2009 to 2013, guiding our country's one of our country's oldest and largest missions. And he also served the following three years to 2017 as US Assistant Secretary of State for Business and Economics, where his responsibilities included internet policy, international trade, and international uh, intellectual property rights protection. So that makes him uh, a valued advisor to this administration and to Congress as he sits on an international policy board. Uh, prior to government service, Charlie was uh, involved in media for more than 20 years as an executive, including as president and CEO of the Jim Henson Company, known for the Muppets, the Muppets, excuse me. Charlie, it's a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon to talk about the future of entertainment. Um, before we get to the pandemic and how it's adversely affected your industry, where were they and how important to the US economy is the motion picture industry? Well, I'm uh, first of all, I just wanna say, Bill, thank you for having me here today. And I also wanna give a shout out to my friend and uh, former business classmate, Glenn Kramer, who, who also asked me to, uh, to participate. It's a real honor. Um, I, and I'm pleased that you asked about the, uh, the economics of the uh, industry because it's not something that people fully understand. Um, we are one of America's greatest export industries. We, we have about two and a half million Americans whose jobs are supported by our industry and in, uh, spread across all 50 states. Uh, we are an export industry. We export to about 130 countries around the world. We export about four times as much as we import. So we are in surplus with almost every single um, uh, trading partner uh, on the planet. Uh, and, uh, and you know the jobs that we pay, the reason people don't really know it is they think of the entertainment industry, they often think of movie stars walking the red carpet. They, they think of uh, people on the covers of magazines. But the two and a half million Americans that I just referenced are uh, electricians and, and production designers and construction workers and caterers and hairdressers. They're blue collar workers taking jobs that pay on average about 70% uh, more than your average job. So uh, it's a high paying industry that really uh, is um, uh, generating a tremendous amount of economic growth for America. And it also exports our soft power. Yes, we're gonna to come to soft power in a moment, but I'd like to go back to um, the jobs and the, the, the weight uh, of revenue for uh, the studios that you represent. Uh, this pandemic has shuttered theaters across the country. And so it's had knock on effects, not only to theater owners and uh, people who produce the films and distribute them and all the laborers that you mentioned, but also uh, companies like Hasbro and toy, toy and merchandiser uh, companies. And, and uh, I'm, I'm sure the food and beverage industry too. We don't have popcorn for our guests here, but could you tell us really the whole ecosystem and, and, and what in maybe dollar terms we're talking about? Last year, uh, 2019, 
we the industry hit a record uh, economic milestone, which is a hundred billion dollars in uh, in revenues from both home video and uh, uh, and and theatrical. Um, in America, it was about it, globally theatrical box office, which you're referring to, was about forty two billion dollars, and it went to effectively zero. Uh, you, you know, and uh, what's interesting about that is that the demand hasn't changed. There's still a lot of people that want to get out of their house and see movies. Uh, but, uh, and you can tell that, I don't know if you follow the press about, uh, for example, drive-in theaters having a resurgence right now. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's people want to get out of their homes. They want to see movies. They're movies that are meant to be seen on the big screen. And, uh, and it's going to happen again, but for the time being, it isn't. And so one of our top priorities as an industry is to get back to work, to get back into production and do so safely. And to work with our friends in the exhibition business and the movie theater business uh, to not only help them with safety standards, but to make sure the theaters are safe, but to convince the, the world public, and in this case, the American public, uh, that it's safe to go back. And th that those are huge priorities for us right now. You mentioned exports. Um, the the, the non-US market for your studios uh, is, is huge. And I wonder if, because many of those markets in Asia and perhaps in parts of Europe, uh, uh, particularly, have done better with COVID than our country has. Um, is that sort of offsetting some of the the business distress for the well, producers? I, I mean, it's a, it's a great point uh, on the economics. America, you know, the the U.S. market was about eleven. Um, point uh, four billion dollars uh, in 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 theatrical, uh, and uh, the Chinese market was about nine billion, and uh, and and on down. Uh, but America was and has always been the number one theatrical market. So so clearly, without the American market online, you're not going to have the same type of uh, revenues that uh, you know that you would have had in the past. But your point about international, I'd say. Uh, at least three quarters of our revenues come from international territories. And I wow. spent a lot of my time on the road meeting with foreign governments uh, to uh, discuss, uh, you know, movies and, and television and Hollywood entertainment. Uh, and, and you're right also that the uh, pandemic ha has impacted different nations differently. And there's a number of countries around the world that are already back into production. An example would be in, uh, in New Zealand, I, I know that Disney's Avatar and Amazon's Lord of the Rings are, are already filming in Australia, Nicole Kidman's Nine Perfect Strangers. And in Europe, I think there's over 20 different countries in the European theater that are, that are working, including Warner Brothers doing The Matrix and uh, Jurassic Park being done in the UK. Uh, in America, it's pretty much shut down with the exception of Tyler Perry, who's done amazing work in Georgia with a closed set and, uh, and yet the demand is there. So what's happened is we've been negotiating with um, uh, the various guilds and unions, uh, mm -hmm. the AMPTP, the Alliance of Motion Picture Television Producers, just closed a deal with the guilds and unions to, uh, to agree on safety standards. So now we're bringing those uh, back online in, in America. I've personally spoken with over 25 of our governors, uh, half of the nation's governors, to talk about how prioritizing our industry as the states recover is really great for their economics. So it's a big issue for us, but we're, we're on, on the right course. I'd like to talk about your association and, and why you even took this job, Charlie. Um, there are only six members, yeah. uh, but, but, but they're big and powerful and wealthy. And in 2019, I believe it was, Netflix became the first streaming company to be part of MPA, replacing 21st Century Fox, which was uh, its film assets were acquired by Disney. So it's a small group, but I gather it's a fairly fractious group. What's it like to lead them? Why did you want this job? Um, that's, that's, I have the best job in the world, So, but it's a fair, it's a fair question. <laughs> so, no, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're right. Disney, Warner, NBC, Universal, Netflix, Paramount, Sony, those are my six members. Um, I was proud to have brought Netflix in because it recognizes the way the industry is changing. We are, uh, we are not, you know, the movie company. We're not the Motion Picture Association of America. Yeah. We are a content creation and content protection association for the planet. And Netflix is making amazing product and they are a very solid member right in the heart of our, of our business. Um, uh, but to answer your question, if you give me just a little latitude, I need to go Please. a little bit further back. 
Um, my father, uh, I'm going way far back. My father was uh, an ambassador under Kennedy and Johnson. And uh, he, he sadly died at 48 when he was serving as ambassador in Dakar. I was a young boy and didn't know him well, but I grew up believing that serving as an ambassador was the highest calling. It was the thing that I you know, would always want to become, but I didn't know how to get there. That was like a pipe dream. It was the same way I wanted to be the coach of the Chicago Bears. It wasn't going to happen. Uh, growing up in Chicago, but I, but I tell you that um, uh, you know I chose a different path. I chose entertainment instead because I believe that government and and foreign policy and and diplomacy can have an enormous positive impact on the planet. But after business school, I met Jim Henson, and uh, Jim believed that media, if used properly, could be a great force for good. And he showed it because he created Sesame Street, raising the level of preschool education. Um, around the planet and you know no Muppet ever died in a Muppet movie or was beheaded or anything <laughs> like that. Um, he was a, you know he was a good and extraordinarily creative human being. So uh, so I worked for um, a pig and a frog, Miss Piggy and Kermit. Uh, I apologize to Piggy for the reference. Uh, and uh, uh, and we had an amazing experience and I also uh, ran a company called Wild Brain which created, I, I was the executive producer of a show called Yo Gabba Gabba for those in the audience that have uh, Teen, uh, children, uh, they, they, they may appreciate that uh, this show, which I always say put the cool in preschool because it uh, had indie rock bands and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, from there, uh, after having met uh, Senator Obama, uh, I, I was extraordinarily lucky to have been asked to serve as ambassador of France. So, uh, you know, to go from a pig and a frog to the president of the United States makes for an eclectic background. <laughs> I understand. I get that. But, but then I went on to do something even stranger, which is most bilateral political ambassadors don't then go to the State Department to run policy. And that's what I did with the Economic Bureau. So to answer your question in the most long-winded way possible, uh, when um, I got done with my eight years at State, what was I to do next? And I wanted to find a job that combined uh, diplomacy, government, entertainment, media, management, strategy. And there weren't very many jobs like that. And this particular job uh, it, you know, plays on all of my past experiences. And you, pointed out, the, you pointed out the six studios, you're right. It takes a little diplomacy to um, to manage among studios that uh, compete with each other very aggressively on a daily basis. Uh, but uh, but I'm what an amazing moment to be leading the uh, entertainment industry as as the association chief. And we've done it here at the MPA. We've been you know the industry leaders uh, for a hundred years. So it's a wonderful wonderful tradition to to uh, to, to you know to to join. Certainly, I. Um... My association is 90 nonprofit, independent, nonpartisan world affairs councils, but it's a pretty harmonious bunch, I gotta say. But I could probably learn something. I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm sure I could learn something from you because they are now uh, shifting, they have shifted very, very quickly and seamlessly to digital programming like we're doing now. But there are so many programs uh, going on every day, every week. Uh, Richard Haas has appeared at seven or eight different councils already, the, the president of CFR, who you're a member of his organization. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we not cannibalize each other? Um, and uh, it's a long way from say, Disney and Netflix, but I know that even pre-pandemic, Disney was shifting to uh, Disney Plus, and and really this is a direct cons to consumer uh, strategy with uh, premium video on demand. I don't know does that does that business as necessary as it is does that uh, really get up to enough uh, cash that it's going to overtake what they could earn in the studios in the in the theaters? I'm sorry. Well, first of all, to your point about association management, it sounds as though you have a very cohesive uh, association, but that you're trying to coordinate with all other um, uh, similar, if you will, organizations around the world, which is always, uh, uh, you know, challenging, um, but different than having inside the same tent people that have, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthy rivalries. Uh, but I find that in diplomacy, and, and certainly in my current job, that the way to manage uh, disparate teams is to find common ground. And um, you know, so what we do at the MPA is we focus on things that all of the studios would like us to achieve. And there's an old uh, proverb that says a, a finger can be easily broken, but when it's formed into a fist, it's a lot harder to break. And we have a six fingered fist, I suppose I could say in the MPA that is quite powerful given our economics to advance the cause for all. Uh, and, and you mentioned about the digital services. So Netflix, 
the first digital player, pure digital player to come in is one, but the other five are doing it as well. Disney Plus, as you mentioned, HBO Max, uh, Paramount has now uh, Paramount Plus with Viacom. Uh, you have Peacock from NBC Universal. You have, um, uh, and in addition, you have Amazon Prime and uh, and um, uh, and Apple TV. So there are a lot of great you know great services uh, out there. And the way I look at it is again, our association is content creation, content protection, screen agnostic. My member studios are going to make product for iPhones. And they're going to make product for the biggest uh, HD IMAX theater in the, on the planet. Uh, we make good stories well told. And the distribution, uh, it, you know, the, the more distribution vehicles, the more opportunities for creatives. Uh, I think we are literally, and we certainly were before the pandemic, uh, in, in the golden age of content creation. Because all of these digital services open up venues for creative stories to be told. It's not a cannibalization issue in my mind. In fact, uh, young people are the biggest demographic for theaters. And our statistics, our research shows that people that own six individual electronic devices are the most frequent moviegoers. It's not a cannibalization. There's certain movies that you want to see in theaters and certainly you want to watch on your iPhone. Uh, so I think there's room for growth in all aspects and all distribution uh, channels. How about growing the organization? Um, is there a reason that Apple TV or Lionsgate or other other enterprises are not members of your association? Do they belong somewhere else or are your fees too high? Uh, well, our fees are very reasonable, of course. So I, <laughs> I'm sure that's that's can't be the issue, Bill. But but I I um uh, I, I think um uh, you know I've I've had conversations over over the years with with Apple and with uh, with Lionsgate and with Amazon and anybody else who's making wonderful content. Um, and in my opinion. Uh, you know, why wouldn't they at some point want to be part of the Motion Picture Association? Why wouldn't they want to be part of this group? So um, I, my hope is inevitably we, we have the largest content creators on the planet, not just American companies, but international companies, all at the core of our association. But for the time being, the six members represent the vast proportion of, of uh, production that's being made uh, uh, around the planet right now. We, we really do have a huge percentage covered by those six. And Maybe one day you'll see more. I'll, I'll come back and talk about it. Very well. I'm, I'm going to shift um, in a moment to your diplomatic service, but um, no doubt you'll have needed your skill set for some of the other uh, crises that have happened during your short tenure at MPA prior to the pandemic, which is a huge uh, issue that you're navigating. But during your time, um, is it, it overlaps. It, it coincided, I should say, with with the Me Too movement uh, uh, stemming from Hollywood um, and Black Lives Matter in terms of, uh, we hear, you know, certainly we hear at, at the Academy Awards from the stars about uh, what women and people of color face. How are you working to uh, shape uh, diversity and inclusion and equity in the studios? Well, that, that's a fantastic question. Thank you for, for raising it. And it's kind of two part in a way. You talked about diversity, equity, inclusion. You talked about BLM. They're part of the same equation, but I want to take them separately for a second. Uh, the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we began our diversity, equity, inclusion uh, group in 2012 here at the Motion Picture Association, which was three years before Oscars So White. Uh, and so we, we understand the importance of it. Uh, when you think about it, um, you know, people want to see themselves on screen. It's not only the right thing to do to have great diversity in our product, but it's the smart thing to do. It's the economic thing to do. And, and so clearly our studios uh, understand that. Uh, when you think about Black Panther, you know, at, at the time Black Panther came out, conventional wisdom was you can't have a movie uh, that has an entirely black cast and, and, and be a blockbuster. Well, they were as wrong as they can be. You can't have a black superhero, wrong. Uh, you know, Crazy Rich Asians, huge success. Uh, Into the Heights with uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda coming out uh, is gonna be, I'm convinced, a huge success for, for Warner Brothers. So we're proving time and again. But what you're seeing on screen is only half the battle because it's also who's working behind the cameras and how do they get fed into the system. And so we have alliances with so many groups that are helping train and, and, and bring people into the industry at, at, a, at, a, at a lower level. As far as women go, uh, we're not there yet. We get it, we see the problem, we understand the problem, but we're not there yet. But there's some encouraging signs. 
uh, last year, um, I think that the female directors reached an all-time high. 10% uh, of, the, of the highest films were directed by women in 2019, up from 4.5%. Um, half the leading role, 40% of the leading roles were women. We, we know we have a long way to go, um, but we're, we're aware of the issue, and every one of the six studios is focusing on it. Now, I don't control operations, so I can't tell any of the member studios who they should hire. Hmm. But I do have an association, and I'm proud to say that in my association, I just calculated the other day, about 65% of my senior executives are women, and we are an extremely diverse association, both uh, uh, culturally, uh, ethnically, uh, you know, with um, sexual preference, you name it. We, we represent America, uh, and I'm proud of that, because uh, the fish smells from the head, as, you, as, as they say, uh, and it's, an important, it's important for me. Uh, but, but back to BLM, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you, if, if you know this, but Bill, because you probably have seen our our iconic building in Washington, D.C., which is a stone's throw from the White House. But uh, we just renovated it, and, and it's beautiful. Uh, we have um, all these fantastic icons, Hollywood props and, uh, uh, and memorabilia in our, in our lobby, uh, state-of-the-art screening room, et cetera. But its address is now proudly 888 Black Lives Matter Plaza. It is right across from the, the church that was the President Trump visited. It, it's, it's very, very, very right in the center of everything, in front of our door is the word matter. Uh, and you know what? It matters to us. And we are doing a ton of stuff. And I, I just, I, my organization knows that it's not about um, talking about how important this is, it's doing things. And uh, we, we've, uh, we created a series called Film School Friday, which originally was meant to bring Washington DC into our beautiful home and children uh, throughout uh, the city to, to see what it's like to be in the Motion Picture Association. But we've evolved it online into these wonderful uh, seminars that, um, uh, that uh, really explore uh, these issues. And in fact, tomorrow uh, is gonna be our seventh such, such seminar. We, uh, we have something, uh, this will be on Peacock called Black Boys, uh, talking about racial diversity. We had, I don't know if you know Laverne Cox, and she was uh, famous for Orange is the New Black and a number of other things, but she, she was interviewed about, it was, she interviewed trans, uh, transgender creatives behind the, the film Disclosure during Pride Month. Um, we, our virtual program reaches thousands of people. And so we are right at the heart of this. It is a huge priority for us. Hollywood has a long way to go, uh, but it's on, the right, it's on the right track. It really is. And, and we're there to help make sure that uh, our studios can see best practices from each other. Well, certainly from the vantage of your physical office in DC, uh, I know after the, the tragic and awful killing of George Floyd, uh, the protests there resulted in just um, actually some terrific uh, visual art that were that was hung and and pasted to the fences around the White House grounds and and the park there. Um, do you see uh, the pandemic because it's so intertwined with the economic crisis and also the social upheaval uh, generating a kind of real powerful shift in America's culture and arts and how that might be channeled, um, not only uh, richly in our own country, but also as, a, as an element of our soft power, uh, which seems to need some rejuvenation around the world. Well, um, uh, first of all, you talked about the beautiful art that was created. Um, our building is boarded up, I think, still to this to this day. Uh, but um, what you'll see hanging on all those boards and on all the windows in the upper floors are Black Lives Matter signs, uh, mm -hmm. supporting supporting the cause, being on the right side of history, if you will. Um, and uh, our movies are a reflection of society, and the power, our soft power, comes from that. We. I would argue, um, maybe some would disagree, that one of the reasons that Chinese films uh, don't export as well as American films is they, their films are made by the Propaganda Bureau. They report into the Propaganda Bureau and they're very internally focused. They do great inside China. But our movies reflect our society and show the world who we are as a nation and what we stand for. And it's an enormous uh, asset for America because they have so much to be proud of. And in reflecting society, there's no question that what we're going through right now is gonna make it onto the big screens and the small screens alike. And that we're gonna do a whole bunch of, uh, films will help provoke the discussion, the soul searching that will need to come in the years ahead. 
uh, of uh, whether we can do better in the next pandemic, you know, what, what it means, uh, what, what the pandemic has exposed in terms of inequities. Uh, I'm sure that, that the entertainment industry will do a great job in highlighting some of these issues. But soft power is one of our greatest strengths in the industry. As you know from your service as U.S. Ambassador to France and Monaco uh, in 2009 to 2013, I don't know which president, probably Sarkozy, but perhaps it was Hollande, uh, who presented you with the Légion d'honneur award and commander of France, I guess was the title that went with that. Yes. Um, which, which president? It was presented to me directly by President Hollande. Hollande, yes. okay. I don't know about his uh, being a film buff, but I know that Sarkozy was uh, certainly is certainly a film buff and you presented him with something I, I, I know. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, uh, your research is pretty extraordinary and you're right uh, on, on that topic. I, just really quickly, it's kind of a funny story. Um, when I was heading to, to Paris, um, I did a lot of research about who President Sarkozy was in charge at the time. And I, I wanted to know more about him. And I read a speech that he gave to Congress in 2007, where he talked about his inspirations. And his inspirations, what, what drove him to the highest office in France, was watching American movies in the 1950s. And he loved Rita Hayworth in particular, and Marilyn Monroe, and John Wayne, and all these icons of American culture. That he grew up you know, believing that anything was possible. And so what I did was I called the then head of um, uh, Columbia Pictures, because that's where Rita Hayworth used to work. And I got this unreleased uh, photograph of Rita Hayworth, put it in an Art Deco frame, and I brought it with me to Paris. Now, President Sarkozy, amazing president, uh, was not, uh, didn't really enjoy meeting ambassadors, um, but, uh, but the, you had to present your credentials to the president in order to serve. And he would gather all these ambassadors together, take the credentials and call it a day. Uh, so instead, I sent this to the Elysee Palace beforehand. And when he, um, when he reached for my credentials, he looked at me and he said, j'adore cette photo, c'est dans la résidence, j'adore cette photo. I love that picture, it's in my house. So the idea, wow. the, the thing itself that drove him to great heights watching American movies, he sees every day as he walks past Rita Hayworth, reminds you of the impact it has on future generations. And, and there's another story, it, it, you'll, you'll cut me off if I'm talking too long, Bill, but, but there's another story if you have time to tell you Please. about. Hollywood movie stars can be great ambassadors because they're seen on the big screen, they're seen, they're, they're accepted by every culture. So I was in France, there's a place for those in the audience who, who spend time there uh, called the, the banlieue. The banlieue is sort of the, the outskirts of Paris and it's usually poor and it's usually people uh, uh, you know, who, who've, who've come from elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, uh, generally of color. And, um, and uh, they felt disenfranchised. And so on a counterterrorism level, my embassy wanted to go there because there's a lot of unhappiness about America and the banlieue. So I went to places that other ambassadors hadn't, but I, of course, had these armored cars and everything. And I, I, I remember talking to a group of kids and they were telling me what they hated about France. And so I said, well, what do you like about America? And the answer was, America? Oh, we like um, Samuel Jackson, uh, Will Smith, Will I Am, uh, Jodie Foster, uh, you know, everybody. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna come back with one of these guys. And, uh, and they said, oh, ambassador, uh, Long de Bois, which, uh, which means I have a wooden tongue, you know, like all politicians, uh, you'll, you're never gonna deliver. But in the category of it's better to be lucky than good, uh, about a week later, Sam Jackson called me because he was in Paris. And so I said, you're coming with me. And I dragged him out to a place called villiers le bel in what's called the Neuftois region. And uh, the same guys, the, car, the armored car opens and they start screaming, Big Mac, because for those in the audience that have seen uh, Pulp Fiction will remember that that was a scene from Pulp Fiction with Sam Jackson. And Sam Jackson, is a larger than life character, but to them, he didn't belong to anyone. He was a movie star, but he gave them a speech that day about how the French dream is the American dream and vice versa. And if you work hard and if you believe in yourself, you can achieve anything, which is what he did. And he left there creating an enormous uh, surge of goodwill covered all over the, the, the press. Uh, and, uh, and it's an example of, of how, you know, these are proud Americans mm -hmm. who when they uh, choose to be diplomats uh, many times can do a wonderful job. Do you know if uh, any subsequent ambassador visited the banlieue? I think you were the first. I was the first uh, and I don't think anyone has since, but I, I do know that um, that I delivered on my promise and Will Smith, uh, Will I Am, Jodie Foster, Woody Allen, they all came 
and later on, so did Robert Redford, Clint Eastwood, Meryl Streep, Sylvester Stallone, Angelina Jolie, Morgan Freeman. And this is while I was a diplomat, right? This wasn't Hollywood. So it's again my life. You've got a whole cadre of, of, of diplomats for because, you. But I know, well, well because yeah. I, I, I was in entertainment before I became, went into diplomacy, and I know that, that I should tap into that resource if I can. Uh, and I've been trying to help other ambassadors, uh, President Trump's ambassadors, um, with movies, because showing movies in the embassy is also a very powerful way of advancing and discussing sure, sure. important policy issues. Well, uh, we're going to shift, and I have questions coming in in the chat box, which is great, and I want to encourage more. Pardon me, Charles, for leaning in. I've been looking at so many Zooms, I think I'm going to go blind, so I'm going to have to get close to my screen. No, it I looks like Patrick Terrian, our uh, president and CEO from the, World, the Columbus Council on World Affairs, is asking about China, which is a good place to shift to. Uh, can you comment on the release of Mulan in China, the reaction it's received, and what China's response means for the future of US film expansion overseas? Well, I mean, that's a fantastic question and it's very, very topical. I, I don't know if he's asking it with um, regard also to the fact that there's a number of, there's scrutiny in Congress about whether any industry, including in my industry, are kowtowing, so to speak, to the Chinese. Because I mentioned they had a $9 billion market last year, but they have 70,000 screens. We have 40,000 screens. They are we're on track to become the number one uh, market for entertainment. And the question is, is Hollywood going to bend uh, its moral and ethical uh, fabric to uh, you know, benefit from that market? Uh, and, and, and the answer is no. And I'll tell you why, but I know that it's been misconstrued uh, in the press. Um, and, I'll, and I need to go back a little bit uh, to um, say that the MPA exists because of our support of the First Amendment. That is so important to us, the right to free speech. There is no way that we would ever agree to censorship. Censorship is not in our vocabulary. In fact, I don't know, if, uh, Bill, if, you, if, you, um, if you've heard of this or if your members have heard of this, but there's something called the Hayes Code that existed way back when, uh, 1938 in America. And it was basically a code of ethics that Hollywood was not meant to do certain things or else Congress would have to act. And so uh, I'll tell you though, when, when it was put in place, Hollywood shouldn't, I'm, I'm reading this right now, Hollywood shouldn't um, uh, uh, have crime or nudity or profanity, show patriotism, no prostitution, no childbirth. And if you did do childbirth, you better be smiling during childbirth, by the way. No indecent dancing, no open mouth kissing, no profanity. These were the rules and the rules were being broken. And the more they were broke, the more Congress threatened to regulate us and regulate our first amendment right. And that's why 51 years ago, we created the ratings uh, system, which warns parents and warns families what they're gonna see. We're gonna make what we wanna make. You don't have to see it if you don't want. And here's what the rating is. And it's, it's been successful for 51 years. So I tell you that story by way of saying that, that you know, no one wants censorship, but you wanna sell to the 130 countries I mentioned, and you have to take into account sensitivities, cultural sensitivities and, and other issues and, and decide whether you still want your product to, uh, you know, to go there. Uh, so, and just to put it in perspective, if people talk about China, uh, well, um, you know, it's not just, it's not just China that has, that has these issues. It's, it's countries uh, uh, all over the planet um, that, that don't want you to, um, you know, uh, uh, example after example of how they, they don't want you to, um, uh, to show product that would upset them personally. Just give you an example, India uh, mandates um, that you can't do anything against the security of the state. Uh, in the Middle East, in Kuwait, you can't have sex, kissing, or, uh, or or drugs, or black magic, and you definitely can't have bikinis. I know that in in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, no nudity or anything critical. Uh, in Indonesia, no close uh, shots of thighs, uh, and that includes SpongeBob SquarePants's bikini. So bikinis again. Uh, but the point is that uh, that every country has has its limitations, including China. But China, to answer your question thoroughly is um, uh, it represents 5%, 5% of our studio revenues for theatrical and all media revenues, 3%. So there's no way that my member studios are gonna turn on a dime, violate everything the MPA stands for to change our creative so that we can get into, to, in, into this market. Right. Mulan, I can't speak to because it was an operational decision by the Walt Disney Company and I, I, I don't control that. But China will continue to uh, partner with, with uh, Hollywood on films going forward. And Hollywood is very aware not to become a propaganda tool of any government, including China. I, I imagine this might be an issue that you would have taken up when you were uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Business and Economics. The 
there, so there's censor, censorship that way, um, and it infringes the, the freedom of speech, our right to freedom of speech, if you will. Um, but is the TikTok example uh, in somehow infringing on Americans' right to consume? Hugely popular, um, and we're going to block that. Well, TikTok didn't exist when I was Assistant Secretary of State. Um, and today it's kind of out, of out of my wheelhouse. What I can tell you is that we don't use TikTok or any of the divisions of, uh, you know, uh, of the parent company um, in the United States. And, and uh, so it's not really a distribution issue uh, for us. And I, I, I'm not qualified to give you a, 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 you know, a, a response about, about TikTok because it's not in our members wheelhouse right now. I'm sorry. Okay, here's a question from Graham Wrong. With the, uh, excuse me, with the fast achievement of advancement of digital technologies, for example, 5G, uh, internet of things, smart home and uh, business models for, and platforms, what is the future of entertainment gonna be like for, with those technologies in mind? Um, it's, is, as I was saying earlier, it's, it's a huge benefit to the world. I, I don't know if you guys have uh, um, watched as much television as I have during this uh, pandemic, but uh, there's so many channels filled with so much good product. And so it's just going to be good for consumers. It doesn't mean the end of movies, far from it, uh, but it means that more product, more quality product will be available on more distribution systems. So we embrace that change. We're excited about that change. And I think consumers are the ones that are gonna win. Thank you. Uh, Roger Nake in Atlanta is asking about uh, the issue of mental health and the ripple, ripple effect of COVID um, that has affected such a, a vast population in the United States, including moviegoers and people in their homes and, and people who, who have uh, been thrown out of work in your industry. How is the, can you comment on, uh, if there are any um, health and safety issues that, that you look at vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis your members or uh, with respect to legislation on Capitol Hill? The, uh, the legislation on Capitol Hill that we're, we're pursuing, we're trying to get um, uh, kick-started, getting production back and running in the United States so that it can match what's happening overseas. But to do so, we, make, we gotta make sure it's a very different topic got to make sure that when you go back to make a movie that you're entering a set that's safe. And then when you go to a movie, you need to feel comfortable that that theater is also safe. And that's going to take a lot of explaining and a lot of marketing and a lot of discussion and probably, uh, you know, ultimately the vaccine. Um, the uh, issue of mental health, I think it was even raised in the most recent presidential debate. It's, it's a big issue and I understand it. It's, it's not something that my content creation companies uh, are, are expert in, in, in solving, uh, but it's, uh, it's a really serious issue for society. Um, being cooped up, uh, not everybody is, is uh, um, you know, in a, in a place that has uh, the ability to have a, a camera like I do up here in my attic. Um, and, and it's, you know, when you're piled together and your children are in school, uh, you, um, you're trying to get your work done. You have a dual income family. The stress, I can just imagine how, how difficult it is for everybody. Uh, and, and it's a big issue. And I, I'm certainly hopeful that uh, whoever wins the, the current election will prioritize mental health and prioritize some of these issues going forward because we can't, we can't lose sight of how serious it is. I have another question that uh, reverts to China, actually. Um, you recall, I'm sure, in the late 80s, early 90s, roughly, uh, that that um, Sony Pictures acquired Columbia Pictures, and the Japanese were making all kinds of purchases of real estate, uh, trophy real estate in New York and California, and they were going to conquer the world. Well, what is China's influence in terms of uh, financing films? in terms of potential acquisitions or uh, buying up theater companies and the like. Um, do we see this as, as a, uh, uh, a competitive threat that should frighten America or how do you see it? I, look, I, to put it in perspective, when I was Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, I sat on a committee called CFIUS, which is the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States. CFIUS reviewed foreign acquisitions, and it did so with an eye towards national security. And if the Chinese or any other country were buying a company that would impact our national security, 
uh, we weren't going to let it happen and we were going to definitely vote against it. I just think entertainment isn't the same category. I don't believe that our national security is impacted when we have foreign investors helping to make movies as long as we are not being used as a tool of anybody else's propaganda machine, which our studios have no interest in doing. Mm -hmm. So from my vantage point, um, yes, China owns AMC. I'm sure that the, 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 that the audience knows that. Um, AMC being the largest distribution theater chain. It's, it's owned by, uh, by the Wanda Group. Um, China has invested in co-productions. But China's movies, there's a movie in China called uh, Wolf Warrior Two, which didn't export. But inside China did more than a billion dollars. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a Rambo for China. Um, and it was very popular with Chinese audience, but no one, no one else. Uh, China's making a lot of movies for China. And that's not what my studios are, are doing. So they may on occasion take uh, funding from China and other nations, but I don't believe that it, it gets the way of our national security or harms America. To put that number in perspective, if you have it at your fingertips, I don't know, Charlie, but uh, what would be the top US box office uh, figure? I'm not aware of a US movie that did a billion in the US, um, but uh, I think Avatar was close. Worldwide. Uh, uh, well, worldwide, of course, worldwide, sure. multiple billions. Um, uh, but um, but uh, uh, in the US alone, um, I think uh, Avengers Endgame and Avatar were the two biggest grocers and they came probably close. But we sell around the world, that's the difference. China has its own market. Disney, to put it in perspective, last year had eight movies that did a billion dollars worldwide. So, you know, we sell around the planet. We're America's less than 5% of the world's population. And we fortunately have a product that a lot of people like. So we sell to other people and make, make money there. Uh, they like it so much that there's an awful lot of privacy, uh, sorry, piracy still today. In fact, I'd like you to discuss the global effort that led to uh, uh, ending the Sparks operation. This was a, an organized crime group that uh, stole tens of millions of dollars. Can you talk about the case and how, and how the cooperation uh, came together to, to end it? Well, what I can what I can talk about is, uh, and, and just and thank you for raising the topic. Uh, piracy is an enormous concern for our industry and for any creator. Any creator, you don't want your product stolen, um, and it's very difficult in today's world with 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 COVID. Um, uh, you know, I think something like seventy percent of Americans uh, say that they're watching more television during the pandemic. Why why wouldn't they? and 13% have a piracy device at home. And 40% of those people use it as their primary source of movies and televisions. So, um, uh, you know, what I mean by piracy device is, this isn't somebody on the street corner selling DVDs like piracy used to be, you know, well, way back when my predecessors were in this, in this job. Uh, this is piracy, these are organized crime these are uh, really bad apples operating on the dark web with enormous sophistication. So there are things called Cody boxes, for example, which are devices that you can buy legally, but when uh, downloaded with illegal software can basically steal all the content you want from the internet and organize it in a beautiful array on your screen. And so people often don't know that they're buying illegal product because it's marketed as, as being illegal. The problem with going to a pirate site and downloading is not only do you take money from the creators themselves, not only do you prevent studios from even making more movies because they're going to lose so much on piracy, but it hurts consumers. So uh, an enormous percentage, um, near 50% is the last statistic I heard, of people that download illegal content have their computers infected with a virus. And that virus will, <laughs> will cause a, a lot more damage than, than, uh, than people fully understand. So how do you fix it? So how do you fix it? Uh, you know, it's like whack-a-mole. It can happen anywhere in the world. We shut down a service called uh, uh, 123 Movies that was based in Hanoi, but it had pro you know, properties everywhere. And you talked about Sparks, which is a big, big deal. Um, but the way we fix it is by having friends. So we built something called ACE, which stands for the Alliance for Creativity and Entertainment. It has the six MPA studios, uh, and it also has Amazon and a total of 36 global companies. It is this comprehensive, it is the most powerful anti-piracy force ever assembled. We work, um, we've been doing this for a long time at the MPA, but we work with global law enforcement 
to, uh, to make sure that we are shutting down these illegal streams, that we are working with advertisers to not take illegal money from these, these people, We're working with uh, ISPs and intermediaries. We are having enormous success and our, our, the ACE name is known on the dark web and in the piracy community as something to watch out for. We are, it, it's, a, it's a very, very long and unending battle but we are marking success after success and we're building our coalition. And in fact, next week, we're about to announce a new member of our ACE coalition that I think will uh, oh. we'll get some, uh, some attention. Um, so we're, we're fighting this hard and Sparks is one example of how we work with local law enforcement and we take down in Sparks case, the backbone, you know, where, where, where are they storing these, uh, these videos? Who's storing them? How do we get to those storage bins? And this is not, again, mom and pop, or, or a kid on, a, on, a, you know, in his room stealing illegal properties. These are big criminal enterprises that we are shutting down with law enforcement. Wow. Um, we've had Charles, if you don't mind, Charlie, uh, we have a flurry of questions, just three, one big and two fun. Uh, Gloria Murray, can you speak to the idea of how much influence media has on sexism in the United States? Well, I don't, I, I don't have a, a statistic, but you're, you're right to raise this question because um, I said that movies are a reflection of our society, but movies also influence. There's, there's two sides to soft power. We can, we can show America and show what's good about America, but you know, shame on us, for example, if all the bad guys in our movies happen to be people of color uh, and, and that has to change. You know, shame on us if the plots of our movies, um, uh, you know, are, are sexist and, and, and denigrate women. That has to change. And I think that with the diversity, equity, inclusion movement and BLM, which we fully support, this will change. And you know what's going to change uh, sexism depicted in movies is fixing the power imbalance. Because the more women that are in positions of power in my industry, the less uh, of those products that are going to be made, in my humble opinion. And we are really making strides with that. And, uh, uh, and, and I, you know, I mentioned the 65% women in my senior team. I didn't do that. On, I didn't do that because I wanted 65% women. I hired the best people on the planet to be my senior team. I, I put my team at the MPA against anybody in the history of the MPA. They happen to be 65% women. Uh, and that's the way the world is. So the more that, um, the more that we embrace uh, diversity and change, the more that we can reflect society and not only what we make as an industry, but how we make it, who's behind the camera, who's making these green light decisions, the more we can solve these problems. I wanna let the audience know that tomorrow afternoon, we're going to have a discussion of the future of work and talent with two incredible female CEOs, Marjorie Krauss and Corinne Riposh of ADECO. Uh, Marjorie's from APCO Worldwide. Um, last two questions, I'll, I'll give them to you as bullets, Charlie. One is, if you were to pick three countries uh, around the world where you would like to serve as U.S. ambassador, what would they be? And what is your favorite movie? Huh. Well, um, all right, on the ambassador piece, you're asking the wrong person. I, I, I um, for two reasons. One, uh, I, I grew up you know, in embassies with my father, Francophone countries, Luxembourg and Senegal. I lived in France when I was um, in high school for a year with a French family. I, I speak the language fluently. I love France. I was the luckiest person on the planet to have been asked by President Obama to represent America to our oldest ally. It was such a gift and, and every day was a gift. And I was there for four and a half years and I took nothing for granted. Every single day I worked hard as I possibly could. But you're you didn't even take your fear of, of heights for granted. Well, that, that's true. And it, I, I, you must be referring to the fact that every year on D-Day, I would go to, of course, the, the invasion beaches in Omaha Beach uh, to um, honor those Americans who, who lost their lives in World War II. And in order to really do it right, I decided to, um, well, I, we had, um, there's more Americans buried in, in France than in any country in the world, uh, except America, because of how many lives that were lost in World War I or World War II. And I was dedicated to my, um, my military attache who represented all arms of the armed forces. And I say, anything you need, I'll do. And he says, Mr. Ambassador, what I need is for you to jump out of an airplane with the US Army's Golden Knights uh, and land on a field in St. Mary Glees on the 68th anniversary of D-Day. Note, I'm terrified of heights. This is a really bad idea. And I probably, uh, it would definitely have been rejected had I asked to do it. 
But he asked me and I did it. And uh, I landed falling on this field in front of uh, 25,000 people uh, and the, with the Golden Knights and other, uh, other, but you know, I had a chance with the media covering it to talk about how much uh, the sacrifice meant uh, you know, uh, not only to America, but to France, that uh, uh, France helped create America with Lafayette and Rochambeau, and we helped save France on a number of occasions. But France is in my heart, so France is at the top of the list. The reason I say it's a, I'm the wrong person to ask is that I'm, as I say, one of the only guys that went from being a political ambassador to being in charge of policy in the bowels of the State Department, deep, weedy economic policy. So I don't do ambassadorships because I want to live in a nice house and I want to and I want to be an ambassador and I don't like ambassadors that do that. I care about advancing policy and advancing the interests of the American people. And so it doesn't matter which other countries. What matters is if I was asked to serve again, it would be a country that was a hot spot that needed diplomacy where America's interests were at stake and we had to advance the ball and it wouldn't have anything to do with uh, luxury or, or where it is. That being said, Paris is a hell of a place to live for four and a half years. <laughs> Certainly. Um, and your favorite movie? I get asked this a lot, and and I, I'm a huge movie buff. I, I have so many films in my childhood, from the early Star Wars and the uh, to uh, uh, Indiana Jones and all of the, the Spielberg classics. But you know what I always, what I still say is a little movie that many of you haven't seen called A Muppet Christmas Carol. And the reason I, I say this is that Jim Henson was an extraordinary human being. And he died way too early, and he would have changed the world, continue to change the world had he kept living. And uh, and he died uh, uh, just before we started making a movie, this movie. And in his entire life, nobody else had been Kermit the Frog, because he was the voice and the character of Kermit. And it was it, it, puppeteers needed to be their characters. They could the voice had to be the puppeteer's voice, and no one wanted to step in. But we found a replacement named Steve Whitmire, who was a brilliant puppeteer, and he took over from Kermit. And Brian Henson, Jim's oldest son, I was running the company at the time. He became my creative head, my creative partner. Uh, and I worked for him. He was, he was the CEO and I was in charge of business. He was in charge of creative. And he directed this movie. So we were, we were just coming off the Disney merger. We, we, uh, cause it fell apart when Jim died. We had no cash in the bank. Um, we had our operations completely in shambles. Um, we, we were uh, fighting for our life and this movie meant everything. And Brian had never directed a major feature film. He did it. Steve played Kermit brilliantly. The movie is so heartfelt and you feel the emotion of that moment in the film when you watch it. And, uh, and I, so I highly recommend this Christmas with you have children, A Muppet Christmas Carol. Very good. I uh, can see that labors of love uh, and good stories matter to you much. And it's been a pleasure, Charlie, to talk with you this afternoon. Thank you for giving us extra time and um, I'm grateful to WACA's new chairman, Glenn Kramer, who suggested that we reach out to you. And uh, Glenn may have said, if I recall, you know, this is a bit of an offbeat, out of the box industry that, you know, in world affairs. And I, I immediately said, this is the guy we want. And, you know, our, our folks uh, love to engage with diplomats, uh, American and non-American. And uh, you've really um, given us a lot to think about. And you do seem to have the most interesting job in the world. <laughs> I feel I do. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much uh, to Waka. And uh, it's, a re it's been a real honor. And I hope to continue the conversation uh, in the future one day. I do too, and in person. And I want to remind our audience again that tomorrow is the last day of Conversations with the C-Suite. We will have at 10 a.m. a kind of related industry um, and part of our Wunderbar Together program funded by the German Federal Foreign Office. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Jens Hilgers, who is a serial entrepreneur in the video game esports industry and a German uh, Bundestag member, Thomas Heilmann, along with my new friend, Teresa Miles Walsh, who will be moderating that conversation. It'll be about accelerating the world of virtual reality. We're going to have a world of uncommon reality in the next several weeks leading into November. Pay attention to that news too. Charlie, again, from WACA, thank you. And uh, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, Bill.